Paurava, the Indian king who stopped Alexander. So we will look back in history and uh, look at what happened. There are different uh, sources uh, from various places. Uh, from, there is something of Greek history. There is something of uh, Persian literature, as well as something of our own. And we will look at all these and try to understand what happened in that era and what happened between the historic battle of Paurava against uh, Alexander. Okay, yes. Namaste everyone. Today we will uh, look at uh, Paurava, the Indian king who stopped Alexander and look back into history. And there are multiple sources uh, of information, including some Greek, uh, Persian, as well as uh, Indian literature. We will look at all of them. So this is the agenda for today, Alexander and Greek view. So Alexander himself has written an account of the whole uh, historic battle between him and Paurava. Uh, then there is uh, Persian literature. There is a poet named Firdosi who has covered some information about the historic battle. In fact, he has covered Alexander's life history, uh, referring to him as Sikandar. And then the third part is a slightly different Indian view, which has been nicely covered by Dr. Buddha Prakash. Uh, he published a book somewhere in 1960s, and which has an interesting content. So we will look at all these things, these different sources. So firstly, uh, I want to begin by looking at what Alexander was. So Alexander was born in Macedonia, and he became the king of Macedon, which is in Greece. So born Alexander III of Macedon to Philip and Olympias. In the summer of 336, well, so the key thing that Alexander wanted to do was he wanted to become the king and take over and the throne and eliminate all those who were actually coming in his way, including some his own stepbrothers, cousins, and everyone. So that was his main aim and that was his whole perspective and attitude. So we'll start with the first historical event was in summer 336 while attending the wedding of his daughter Cleopatra, Alexander's sister to Olympia's brother, Alexander the first, not the same as Alexander the third, was assassinated by the captain of his bodyguards. As Pausanias tried to escape, he tripped over a vine and was killed by his pursuers, including two of Alexander's companions, Perdiccas and Leonetus. Alexander was proclaimed king on the spot by the nobles and army at the age of 20. So he has gone ahead and assassinated, you know, this, uh, Alexander the first, who was supposed to become the king, he has also assassinated Philip, who was his uh, stepbrother. And two of his companions were also killed in this whole pursuit. So immediately there was no other successor to the throne and Alexander was made the king at the age of 20. So this was the step that he took to directly take over the throne. And then he began his reign by eliminating other potential rivals. He had his cousin, the former Amnitas, executed. He had two Macedonian princes from, from the region of Lincetus killed, but he spared a third, another Alexander. So you can see Alexander is a very common name in Greece. And Olympias had Cleopatra and Europa, the daughter of Philip Bundelheim. So you can see even Alexander's mother is supporting. Cleopatra was actually again a half-sister, not a complete sister of Alexander. So his mother also is now helping him and getting people killed. Alexander also ordered the murder of Attalus, who was in command of the advanced guard of the army in Asia Minor and Cleopatra's uncle. So you can see he's eliminating as many people who are standing in his way of the throne. This is probably not unusual because we see such things happening even in, if you look at Mughal history, there are definitely cases where uh, the uh, prince has killed his brothers and uh, father also in some cases and take on over the throne. Uh, so uh, this is very similar to that. We can see that the hunger for power was very strongly there. Alexander first consolidated the north, Thessaly and Thracian tribes to surrender to him. Next, he had to stop Thebes, Athens, Phocians, and Plataeans. So these are all smaller kingdoms within Greece. They had different small, small tribes and chieftains like that. So Alexander uh, was trying to also uh, form a, a unify Greece and bring all these tribes under one so that he could be the supreme ruler of Greece. So some people even argue that Alexander unified Greece and tried to put him in a patriotic view. However, his uh, whole aim was to kind of get power. It's more of consolidation of power, making sure all the threats from his neighbors are eliminated. 
So one very interesting thing is how he took over the Thebans. So if you see on the part of the Thebans, the struggle was carried on with a spirit and valor beyond their powers. Since they were ag arrayed against an enemy, who was many more times numerous than they. But when the Macedonian garrison also, leaving the citadel of Cadmia, fell upon them in rear, most of them were surrounded and fell in the battle itself. And their city was taken, plundered and razed to the ground. So you can see the severity with which he is actually attacking them. The reason why he did this is because he did not want any more uh, rebellion or revolt from all the other surrounding people. So this was done in main because Alexander expected that the Greeks would be terrified by so great a disaster and cover down in the quiet. But apart from this, he also plumed himself on gratifying the complaints of his allies. For the Phocians and Plataeans had denounced the Thebans. So now you could see that everyone else were immediately surrendering and saying, okay, we are we will surrender to you, you are our king. This is taken from a work by Plutarch, who was a his Greek historian and has written about Alexander. So why I have presented this slide is to try and throw some light on what is Alexander. What was his character? What kind of a person was he? Because this will be very important in understanding his behavior moving forward. And when we actually reach his encounter with Pavrava. So it is very clear that he is a power hungry person. He wants the throne. He will eliminate anybody in his way. And he will not hold back in raising down or destroying his enemies. He will go to any extent. You can see that their city was taken, plundered and raised to the ground, which was probably not necessary. However, he decided to go ahead. So this is the character of Alexander. The other thing that we will see uh, further on is also contrasting Alexander with the character of Paurava and understand how they were different as people. Okay. So Alexander and crossing the Jhelum. So uh, I have skipped the portion where Alexander conquers Persia, where he uh, comes slowly one by one, he eliminates and takes over kingdoms. He all consolidates the North. He probably didn't move into Europe because Europe was still stuck in the dark ages in those days. And it was mostly barbarians and all. Whereas the Eastern side had a proper kingdom and kings. So Persian kings were there. So he did a lot of conquests and his army was completely invincible. So with all this, he has finally come and arrived and reached Jhelum. Okay, so how he crosses Jhelum and how he starts the battle. So this is how we will go through. Of his campaign against Porus, he himself has given an account in his letters. So Alexander himself has tried to write an account. He says that the river Hidapsis, Hidapsis is what they call Jhelum River, flowed between the two camps and that Porus stationed on his elephants on the opposite bank and kept continual watch of the crossing. So Porus uh, or Paurava was waiting for Alexander to make the crossing. He was ready with his army and elephants. Now elephant was something which the uh, Greeks had not faced before. It was a new type of conquest for them. So, but Alexander was, you know, relentless. He wanted to just go ahead and uh, fight the war. So he himself accordingly day by day caused a great din and tumult to be made in his camp and thereby accustomed the barbarians not to be alarmed. So this is a very important thing. So Alexander on his way to arrive at uh, the Puru Raja, Puru Raja or Paurava's kingdom, he has picked up mercenaries and barbarians outside Paurava's kingdom and uh, nearby bordering villages and towns. So he has tried to bring all these people into his army. Now these barbarians were obviously afraid when they saw the elephants and that's also one reason why they never crossed over and tried to challenge Paurava themselves. Now, Alexander has tried to make the noise. So the noise of the elephant was something that the Greek horses were not used to. Neither were the Greek army used to and neither were the barbarians who were uh, picked up by Alexander. So what he did, he made a lot of noise in his camp all night, day by day, so that the horses and the people and the soldiers, they get used to the elephant's uh, trumpet and sound. So this was his strategy by Alexander. How to make sure that his army is ready for what is coming across the river. Okay. Then on a dark and stormy night, he took a part of his infantry and the best of his horsemen and after proceeding along the river to a distance from where the enemy lay, crossed over to a small island between, that is the island is inside the river. So here rain fell in torrents and many tornadoes and thunderbolts dashed down upon his men. But nevertheless, although he saw that many of them were being burned to death by the thunderbolts, 
he set out from the islet and made for the opposite banks. But the Hedapsis, made violent by the storm and dashing high against its bank, made a great breach in it, and a large part of the stream was setting in that direction. And the shore between the two currents gave his men no sure footing, since it was broken and slippery. So there was a big storm, there was lightning, so these thunderbolts means lightnings, lightning was striking all over the place. Some of them were getting burned down, no lightning detectors in those, so no lightning conductors. So they were just getting burned down. So this was a very, very difficult situation to cross. His men had no sure footing. It was very difficult to cross over. So Alexander himself says that they left their rafts and crossed the breach with their armor on, wading breast high in water. And that after he had crossed, he led his army 20 furlongs in advance of his infantry, calculating that in case the enemy attacked with their cavalry, he would be far superior to them. And in case they moved up their men at arms, men at arms are just infantry again, people who are walking. His infantry would join them in good season. So he had made a strategy. He had put his horsemen ahead so that he will be able to attack their cavalry in case Paurava sent horses to attack. And his infantry was right behind in case their infantry came forward. So he had a very clear strategy. This is all the military tactics. So this is again, as Plutarch says in chapter 60 of his book on Alexander. Okay, so this is how it was. So the gist of this is that it was so difficult to cross over. There were many challenges, but Alexander did not want to give up at this point. He had come this far. He wanted to make a battle. He had to get across. Okay, now we will talk about the actual historic battle. So most of this is covered, taken from what Plutarch has written about Alexander. So after uh, routing a thousand of the enemy's horsemen and 60 of their chariots which engaged him, he captured all his chariots and slew 400 of the horsemen. So you can see the numbers that are coming up here. 1,000 of enemy horsemen, 60 chariots, slew 400 of the horsemen. After he had crossed, he led his horsemen 20 furlongs. Okay, this is the same step. And now Porus, thus led to believe that Alexander himself had crossed the river, advanced upon him with all his forces, except the part he left behind to impede the crossing of the remaining Macedonians. So the strategy that Paurava employed was, he took his entire army, but left a small part to prevent the river crossing, if anyone else wants to cross. Now, Alexander, fearing that the elephants and the great numbers of the enemy, himself assaulted their left wing and ordered Quinas, who was his another trusted cavalryman, to attack on their right. So what they have done is, uh, Paurava has brought his army forward, and there are elephants leading the attack. So Alexander sends one set of uh, cavalry to the left side, which he himself leads, and he arcs, arcs uh, Quinas, who is the next in line, to attack from the right side. So both wings, so he has gone and he has attacked from two sides. So both wings having been routed, the vanquished troops retired in every case upon the elephants in the center. So what happened is, uh, it was a huge army and it spanned a, a large area in length and breadth. So what he has done is he has eliminated one wing on the left and the other wing on the right. So now whoever was left, all of them came closer to the center where the elephants were and they were crowded together with them. And from this point on, the battle was waged at close quarters and it was not until the eighth hour that the enemy gave up. Such then is the account of the battle which the victor himself has given in his letters. So this is uh, everything that we have seen so far is what Alexander has written. So Alexander has written this about the whole battle. And then he says until the eighth hour that the enemy gave up. So let us note this point down. According to Alexander, the enemy has given up. This is what Alexander has written in his account. That he used a military strategy and uh, defeated Paurava. And Paurava has given up. Okay. Now we will move to what else he writes. So this is the whole story and which we hear in all history books. Porus was taken prisoner. And when Alexander asked him how he would be treated, he said, treat me like a king. And to another question from Alexander, whether he had anything else to say, he replied, all things are included in my like a king. Accordingly, Alexander not only permitted him to govern his former kingdom, giving him the title of Satrap. So Satrap is uh, an old Punjabi term, which I'm finding in many historical accounts uh, for a chieftain or head. 
to be used for any of those things or somebody who holds multiple kingdoms and but also added it to the territory of the independent people whom he had subdued in which there are said to have been 15 nations nation here means uh, small kingdoms or small tribal groups 5000 cities of considerable size and a great multitude of villages so this is the account of alexander's great magnanimity and uh, showing how great a person and a great king he was okay so the point i want to just make here is this looks slightly contradictory to what we saw earlier on how alexander was uh, you know ready to take over the kingdom and going ruthlessly killing everybody slights there is a slight contrast here however according to alexander he says that he was he decided to be magnanimous all of a sudden but that is fine let us take it at that point this is alexander's account okay so now we will look more at uh, plutarch and what he has written and what he has tried to understand from what really happened so the most important thing that comes out from this whole battle and account is that alexander's army was totally demoralized they were not in a uh, mental state to move forward so this is how plutarch writes as for the macedonians however their struggle with porus blunted their courage and stayed their further advance into india for having all they could to do to repulse an enemy who mustered only 20000 infantry and 2000 horses they violently opposed alexander when he insisted on crossing the river granges also the width of which as they learned was 32 furlongs its depth 100 fathoms while its banks on the further side were covered with multitudes of men at arms and horsemen and elephants okay so this key point here is now alexander uh, apparently uh, after the battle with kaurava he wanted to go further and go into ganga river however uh, history shows that he did not uh, go beyond the bias river i will show a map which uh, indicates where is jhelum and where is bias and how far he had come in it almost come in about 200 kilometers into india even after the battle with kaurava so but the key thing is that he had he wanted to go further and uh, his uh, men were no longer interested in this battle they were demoralized uh, because they could see that 20000 infantry and 2000 horses had uh, given them a very very difficult time uh, blunted their courage and also the important thing is that uh, the jhelum river crossing itself was so difficult uh, then they heard that the ganga river is much much wider 32 furlongs is what they measure it as is much wider and much deeper and on the other side there were many uh, infantry and horsemen waiting okay so with all this we can see that their men were not ready for the next battle okay so there is a information from plutarch which says he carried his conquest from indus to hyphasis hyphasis is actually bias river subduing punjab it was now september 326 bc so fearing the prospect of facing other large armies and extend exhausted by years of campaigning alexander's army mutinied at the hyphasis river refusing to march further east this is a uh, account given by paul cosmin another author he talks about land of the elephant kings so we are seeing all greek and european accounts including alexander's account himself but there itself we can see that there was a lot of demoralization and exhaustion also because they have been uh, you know doing conquest after conquest for so many years now alexander's army finally mutinied and said at the river bias we are not going to move further this is it okay so the key point that we should understand here is that uh, the battle with paurava has demoralized them and uh, that memory of that battle is now preventing them from continuing further so i move ahead okay then this is another uh, greek uh, author arian and he writes about it so he says alexander uh, so he tries to talk about uh, how he tried to uh, save paurava and uh, how he tried to uh, help Paurava during the battle. So he says, Alexander, having seen that he was a great man and valiant in the battle, was very desirous of saving his life. So now this is a small contradiction that we see compared to what Alexander's character was before. See, earlier he wanted the throne. 
he wanted to conquer he wanted power now suddenly he is worried about saving kauravas life in the battle so this is a little contradiction that we start to see so he accordingly sent first to him taxiles the indian who rode up as near to the elephant which was carrying for us as seemed to him safe and bade him to stop the beast assuring him that it was no longer possible for him to flee and bidding him to listen to alexander's message but the important thing is this uh, person taxiles uh, it's not clear what was his real indian name we are only getting his greek name but what happened is this uh, person taxiles is supposed to be a enemy of kaurava and the name taxiles kind of uh, suggests he is from takshila takshila is now in pakistan so this is kaurava's reaction but when he saw his old foe taxiles he wheeled around and was prepared to strike him with a javelin and he would have probably killed him if he had not quickly driven his horse forward out of the reach of porus before he could strike him so paurava is now very angry with whoever this enemy is and why is he coming and talking to me and asking me to go and talk to alexander so a very important thing to note alexander has sent somebody to his, uh, to paurava so this whole battle is going on alexander is fighting with paurava and uh, what would be the expectation the expectation would be okay alexander wins the battle paurava surrenders and then the whole magnanimity history should happen however it seems a little odd that now alexander is sending representatives and emissaries and trying to tell paurava to stop now unfortunately he did not know about this enmity or he probably knew it whatever but uh, paurava his reaction is okay why is my enemy coming and talking to me i want to kill him and he immediately tries to try uh, kill this person but not even on this account was alexander angry with porus but he kept on sending others in succession so he has sent more and more and more uh, messengers to porus and telling him to stop fighting and to come and talk but paurava is still continuing to fight and the last of all morais an indian because he assented that he was an old friend of porus as soon as the latter heard the message brought to him by meros being at the same time overcome by thirst he stopped his elephant and dismounted from it so it is also said that this taxiles and some of the other messengers that were sent uh, in some other accounts it is there that uh, paurava has actually used try to even use his elephant to trample these fellows down so he attacked them even with his elephant all these messengers who came but meros was his friend so paurava did not react that way he was actually nice with him and uh, he stopped and dismounted from his elephant and then he drank some water and felt refreshed and then he told meros to lead him without any delay to alexander and meros led him thither so this is from aryan who has written another book on anabasis of alexander so the messenger meros is also mentioned by greek historian curtis quantis rufus who is a, a much later historian in, in exactly the same description so this information is also verified in multiple sources that alexander tried to send messengers telling paurava stop the battle is going on we we need to stop come and talk so alexander is asking him to come and talk it's not paurava who is uh, trying to go and do the talking paurava is busy fighting and he is trying to even strike down every messenger who comes it is alexander who wants to stop the war that is the point that comes out clearly from this particular count moving forward <clears throat> fear of magadha now this is probably one very important point which is written in plutarch uh, so after we have seen that the uh, army of alexander was uh, demoralized because of their battle with paurava they also mutinied in the river bias but this is a very interesting way in which it is written for they were told that the king of gandrites and prasai were waiting for them with 80000 horsemen 200000 footmen 8000 chariots and 6000 fighting elephants and there was no boasting in these reports so the point that is happening here is ganderites is referring to ganges river and uh, prasai is uh, perhaps referring to uh, the patliputra in uh, magadha and perhaps even kanauj where the magadha dynasty was there at that time so magadha was at that time ruled by the nanda dynasty and uh, the king uh, at that time was the king dhananda so there is a mention of him as agramis so the greeks had a, a greek name for almost every king at that time so there is also a reference to chandragupta maurya as the androcotus or sandrocotus 
so dhananand they had called him as agramis and uh, this was the big fear now so why the mutiny happened why were they demoralized they thought okay 20000 and uh, footmen and 2000 uh, horses have done this to us think what will happen when 80000 horsemen 200000 footmen 8000 chariots and 6000 fighting elephants came what will be our plight so now the whole point that comes out is alexander's battle with kaurava and after that what would be the reason for alexander to turn back and go away from india right so that was one of the important questions in history and it is kind of coming out at this point that perhaps they were demoralized there were also there was also a lot of fear you can see that there was fear in this uh, particular uh, talk that though there are so many uh, horsemen to fight so many soldiers to fight elephants chariots and this small king has actually given us so much trouble there is a bigger dynasty waiting for us further in the ganga river so it was the demoralization and the final mutiny that perhaps made alexander turn back and say okay i cannot go beyond india this is probably as far as i can go so the fear of magadha was there however a word about king dhananand he is not considered to be a very noble king and many people in his kingdom were unhappy and uh, that is the the other part of history which comes with uh, chanakya and uh, chandragupta maurya who say that they realize that the people are unhappy and finally king dhananand is overthrown by chandragupta maurya and the maurya dynasty is established inside magadha so that is the next part of history but at the time when alexander came king dhananand was the king of magadha and they had a formidable army and a very big empire okay we will move forward yeah so now i am actually showing this map so this point in this coordinate is actually jhelum river and this is perhaps where the entire historic battle took place and this is all in pakistan now and uh, bias river comes here in the northern tip of punjab northern part of punjab and this is a long distance almost 200 kilometers distance so after his battle with kaurava alexander has not stopped he has actually gone forward but at some point this whole uh, mutiny had to happen so following alexander's victory at the siege of sangala and his he and his men reached the river hypasis this is bias alternatively known as bias according to aryan the country beyond hypasis was said to be prosperous and its inhabitants able farmers and brave fighters these indians also had many more elephants than any other of their countrymen and what is more elephants of surpassing size and courage these reports stirred alexander's desire to go farther but the macedonians by now had grown quite wary of their king's plans seeing him charging from labor to labor danger to danger so this uh, elephants were bigger and this is exactly where the magadha dynasty would have uh, existed at that point of time this border is where magadha dynasty started that is the whole power that they are talking about the men reached a consensus they did not want to follow alexander further into indian territory so diodorus siculus adds to the feelings of the soldiers so this is another author so aryan is one author diodorus siculus is another author so we are looking at different greek sources alexander observed that his soldiers were exhausted with their constant campaigns they had spent almost 8 years among toils and dangers and it was necessary to raise their spirits by an effective appeal if they were to undertake the expedition against the gandharide so gandharide means the ganga kingdom or the kingdom which governed and ruled over the ganga river and the entire gangetic plain there had been many losses among the soldiers no relief from fighting was in sight the hooves of the horses had been worn thin by steady marching <clears throat> arms and armor were wearing out and greek clothing was quite gone they had to clothe themselves in foreign materials recutting the garments of the indians this was the season also as luck would have it of the heavy rains so most likely he has come <clears throat> during monsoon season so monsoon season in uh, india of course is heavy rains constant rains so that was adding to his problems these had been going on for 70 days to the accompaniment of continuous thunder and lightning so not only was un alexander unfamiliar with the territory unfamiliar with the kingdoms uh, he was also unfamiliar with the weather and all these things were actually finally demoralizing him this is perhaps the reason why he decided to turn around and say okay 
I have had my conquest. I cannot go further. So just a quick conquest map of Alexander. So this is Macedonia. We started from here. So he has conquered a few uh, Greek kingdoms and um, he has captured all this Syria, Armenia, Babylonia, Persian area. This is all then Persia, Gedrosia. And then he has come to this final point of India, Gandhara. So I've just uh, kind of picked up. So this is Hidapsis River and just uh, sort of enlarged this part. You can see uh, this is the Hidapsis River. And then he has probably come this far up to Bias River. And that is as far as he has gone. And this is actually picked from the US Military Academy. So this is as far as he has come. And he has not gone beyond this. So this is his extent of his conquest. Note that he has also conquered Egypt in the path. So the arrow kind of denotes his path. He goes here, he comes back, then goes through this whole path, comes here, comes here, goes somewhere here towards Chinese area, comes here, and then turns back and goes backwards, back to Babylonia. And in Babylonia, he meets his fine, his end. He died in Babylonia in 326 BC. Okay. So Magadha and Maurya kingdoms, just a little word about these kingdoms. And again, this is accounted by Greek uh, authors and historians, uh, Plutarch only. Nanda ruler is said to be disliked, hated by his subjects. His army was comprised of 200,000 infantry, 20,000 cavalry, 2,004 horse chariots, 3,000 elephants. Androcottus, so this is Chandragupta Maurya, met Alexander. Androcottus later declared that Alexander could have easily conquered the Nanda territory because the Nanda king was hated and despised by his subjects as he was wicked and of no origin. And apparently he came as a barber. So Androcottus, when he was a stripling, saw Alexander himself. And we are told that he often said in later times that Alexander had narrowly missed making himself master of the country since its king was hated and despised on account of his baseness and low birth. So a wicked king. So this is a very important point in history. See, Chandragupta Maurya took over the kingdom of Magadha right after Dhanananda was uh, taken off the throne. The important point is that the reason why a kingdom becomes weak is very clear over here. When you have a wicked ruler, somebody, a king who is hated and despised by his subjects, the kingdom grows weak. So that's a very important point. And even Androcottus of Chandragupta Maurya makes a note of that. He tells Alexander that, you know, if you had actually tried to attack this, his army would have split up because nobody was motivated and did not have the morale to go ahead and fight for their king. So this is a very, very important point. And it also continues to happen even in today's world because our soldiers and anybody who is defending our territory must have the morale and motivation to fight and defend the land. If that motivation is missing, their uh, ability to defend will come down. So the morale and uh, the motivation of the army must always be kept high. That's a very important point that uh, Chandragupta Maurya makes. And this is also accounted for by Plutarch. Okay, <clears throat> so we have covered a lot of uh, Greek history, uh, Greek historians. I will share the, the sources where I've picked them up from. Uh, if anyone wants to go ahead and read them, we will be able to read them. Uh, so we will now move on to Persian literature. But before that, let me just summarize what the Greeks have told. See, the Greeks have tried to paint Alexander as a great hero, as a great king, uh, also somebody who had a lot of magnanimity, but they have not uh, held back in telling the truth that his uh, soldiers were demoralized. They had had a difficult time in battle. It was not easy for them to go on. And there was mutiny and Alexander said, okay, let us go back. This is, the, this is as far as we can go. And uh, his, his own health started deteriorating after that. By the time he reached Babylonia, he, he himself died. Okay. So now we will look at Persian literature. This is mainly by one uh, Persian poet named Firdosi, who was in the 10th century, <clears throat> almost uh, 1300 years later, actually 1300 years after this whole battle took place. And he has tried to account uh, all whatever happened about uh, Sikandar. And what he, he refers to Alexander as Sikandar. And uh, this is actually Shah Nama. Shah means king. Nama means book of kings. Like there are also things like Babar Nama and also there are, so they use this Shah Nama, Shah Name. There are different spellings. All means the same thing, book of kings. 
So Firdosi Shahname is what is written by Firdosi. It's a long epic poem written by the Persian poet Firdosi. So spellings are also different, but we are talking about the same poet here. So one of the important things is that there is a translation into English uh, by some European who understood Arabic. So he says, so this is the part where he talks about the battle and what actually happened in the battle. He says, till as he wheeled with four upon the held, a mighty shout arose behind the host, which filled four's heart with dudgeon and distracted his heart and eyes and ears. Then like a blast, Sikandar issued from the dust and smoke, the hero with his sword, cloud crest, head, neck, and from the steed, the body sank to the earth. So what Firdosi is describing over here uh, appears to be that he is actually uh, killing Paurava. Okay, this is what it appears to be. It appears that from the steed, the body sank to the earth, saying Paurava fell. Okay, Firdosi refers to Paurava as Fur, sometimes spelled Fur, if you are. Uh, spelled Fur is because of the translation. So the head of Indian Fur is in the dust. His elephantine form is cloven asunder. The warriors of Hindustan assented. They went and saw Fur's head all dust and blood. So, so this particular translation from Kirtanama is kind of indicating that Paurava actually died in the battle with Alexander. Okay. So this is what the translation says, as translated by some European author. Okay. Now they will bring you a direct translation because this is how uh, I have actually tried to take uh, the original Persian text, uh, simply run it through a Google translation and try to arrive at what is the actual thing that he is saying. So this is very poetically written. The earth became iron, the air was ebony. He also wears the badge of Hindu fighter. He brought it to his face. A roar came from the room of friends. The head of the border of India, four Hundi's head is on the ground. His pillow is like Chuck Andrus. Why are you fighting now? Such a sword wound and several delays. Alexander made you so that poor from the search, you have to fight and fight. Snowball of India, they started to sing together. Snowball of India, so this singing is the Greeks are singing. They saw ten poor full of blood and dirt. So this is what he's trying to say in the, uh, the European translation is also trying to say that he was full of blood and dirt. From India, a great wrestler, he gave him the head of the royal throne and said, the dinar can never be hidden. Forgive and eat whatever comes. Give me the throne, the Panji Manas. Sometimes it was Alexander and sometimes it was Horus. So now there is a little confusion. All this place, he is talking about Hindu fighters, poor Handi's head, ten four full of blood and dirt. And now suddenly, sometimes it was Alexander, sometimes it was Horus. So I will explain what is this thing a little later. I just hold that for a minute. But right now, the important thing is, he has said here full of blood and dirt, but he moves ahead and says, sometimes it was Alexander, sometimes it was Horus. Now he uses a different spelling, as well as he's trying to say, sometimes something is good. So, sometimes it is pain and anger, and sometimes it is taste and sadness. Okay. He gave Durms and Dinars to his army, bring his country back. Okay, so this is all the translation, literal translation of what is there in the Firdosi Shahnama. But I will explain this a little bit differently. So the, the point that is trying to come out here from these two points, uh, slides of what uh, Firdosi Shahnama says is, it says, uh, here it says Paurava was killed, but somehow later it makes a statement to indicate that Paurava is still alive. Okay, so a different view. So now we will. So that was the Persian literature. So there is more of his accounts on, uh, say, uh, Alexander and his exploits. But I have tried to focus on whatever uh, is relevant to power of our party. Now, in 1960, by the Persian poet, we have seen that Alexander was defeated by us. And this explains why Alexander left him so much better. This theory, which has been revived in Pakistan in the 1990s, cannot be accepted as serious scholarship, but perhaps the right to stress that was by some Okay. Okay. 
So <clears throat> after looking at the Persian view, now let us look at the Indian view. So interestingly, the Indian view is also derived from the Persian account. So in 1960, an Indian scholar named Dr. Buddha Prakash has argued, basing himself on the famous medieval epic named Shahname by Persian poet Firdosi. That Alexander was defeated by Porus, that the two men became friends. And this explained why Alexander left him so much territories. This theory, which has been revived in Pakistan in the 1990s, cannot be accepted as serious scholarship, but Prakash was right to stress that Porus, who had suffered a terrible tactical defeat, was in the long term the real victor. Okay, unknown author on Livius.com. So this is an unknown author who has given this account. The important thing to say is that even though Porus is supposed to have suffered a defeat, tactical defeat, he was in long term the real victor. So the result of the battle is certainly disputed. Modern historians led by Dr. Buddha Prakash have a point that perhaps Alexander lost the battle. So this is important now. So this is a slightly different view as given by Dr. Buddha Prakash that Alexander was probably the one who lost the battle. The Greek army was tired and unable to press home their advantage against the elephant corps. And probably Alexander called off the battle and decided on a meeting with Porus. Now, what actually supports this is some of the Greek accounts where it is very clear that uh, Alexander is the one who is sending emissaries and messengers to Parua to stop the fight. Whereas if it, he was winning the battle, it would have been better for him to just continue the battle. It was very unusual for him to start sending messengers to Paurava and say, no, you stop the fight. Usually what happens is in a battle uh, where you are looking at a draw or something like that, or many losses are happening, the person who is a little more on the losing side or slightly has the disadvantage is usually the one who takes the initiative to send a messenger across and say, can you stop fighting? It looks like we are both going to end up losing our uh, people. Okay, now as per Dr. Prakash, Alexander and Porus became friends and Alexander decided to turn back. Also as a mark of great fighting qualities of Porus gifted caste land to him. So the neighboring lands were under some chieftains and barbarians very disorganized. It is also very much possible that those chieftains themselves felt that, okay, here is a righteous king like Paurava, and it will be better if we fused and merged with his kingdom rather than try to run a, you know, a small barbaric tribe on our own. So it is also possible that it was not just Alexander who gifted the land, but the people of that land themselves wanted to be part of Paurava Rajya. Dr. Prakash also bases his conclusion on the Persian epic. In this epic, the great poet clearly mentions Alexander was defeated by Porus. Now, this is the translation given by uh, the Dr. Buddha Prakash. He rushed forth from the center of his troops. Sikandar said to him, oh, noble man. Sikandar said to him, oh, noble man, our two hosts have been shattered by the fight. The wild beasts batten on the brains of men. Horses' hooks are trampling on their bones. Now, both of us are heroes, brave and young, both paladins of eloquence and brain. And then the other important thing that Dr. Buddha Prakash says is, we have seen that the sons of Porus fell in the battlefield and they were also known by the same name, Porus. So, Paurava lost two sons in the battlefield and they were also known by the same name. So, in any case, by argument and promise, he persuaded Porus to meet Alexander. So, this is, he is referring to Meros. Meros was the messenger who Paurava considered as a friend and finally he listened to him. So he persuaded Porus to meet uh, Alexander, assuring him fully of his safety and the preservation of his royal dignity and status. See, Porova will not simply get down from a battlefield and then walk across to Alexander when he thinks he is going to keep fighting. Porova's aim was not to surrender or do anything of the sort. He was absolutely fine to die in battle and die uh, in that way he considered that a noble death, defending his nation. So the only reason he would actually agree to come and talk to Alexander is if he would assure him, him fully of his safety and preservation of his royal dignity and status. Hence, when Porus approached Alexander with Meros, he did it as a king. And what he demanded of him was treatment as a king. Thus, the meeting of Porus and Alexander was a meeting of a king with a king, and not that of a vassal with an overlord, much less that of a prisoner with his captor. So this is one of the very important conclusions that Dr. Buddha Prakash draws. Why he draws this conclusion is because 
the reason is very simple. Meros was sent by Alexander and he persuaded Kaurava to go and talk to Alexander. Okay, and there was assurance of his safety and the preservation of his royal dignity and status. So we cannot say that Kaurava lost the battle and then came, then a messenger came and called him. There was no need to send a messenger if Kaurava had lost the battle. If Kaurava had lost the battle, Alexander would have gone to him straight away and told him you have lost the battle and whatever. However, Kaurava was made to go and talk to Alexander, where Alexander was waiting in his, with his Greek uh, soldiers. So that can happen only if the messenger convinces Kaurava. And he can do that only if he assures him that you know, your dignity and status will be maintained. So this is not a meeting of a, somebody who has been captured or taken prisoner. This has to be a meeting of equals. And that is why Dr. Badda Prakash tries to say that they became friends. Okay, so ultimately a messenger named Meroes brought his friendship to bear on Porus and thereby convinced him of futility of further fighting and advisability of coming to terms with Alexander. Aryan's account discussed above leaves no room for doubt that Alexander was the first to send the message of peace to Porus and persisted in his efforts to bring it home despite his stubborn reluctance and his provocative rejection of his offer. Of his offer. So, uh, Paurava's provocative rejection is basically he is attacking any messenger who is coming to him. Uh, the first one who was sent to him was actually his enemy. He did not like him, he decided to kill him. And he attacked him with his elephant. And uh, one very important point in history is in those days, <clears throat> elephant tusks were uh, covered with poison when they went into battle. So it was a very dangerous thing if an elephant's uh, tusks attacked a person. So they were covered with poison and that person will die instantly. So it's a very, very good tactical strategy uh, employed by kings of Indian kings of that time. They used to use elephants in the battle for that reason, for multiple reasons, not just because of its size and power, and also because he would be at a higher position, but also because they could use it as a tactical weapon if needed. Okay, so this is the view that uh, Dr. Buddha Prakash brings in, and Aryan's account we have already seen, uh, where he, we see that he sends multiple emissaries. In today's Pakistan, okay, so this is what I have picked up from very recent times. Salman Rashid writes, this is very important to note about character. We do not celebrate Paurava. We name no roads after him. Do not teach our children of his lofty character because he shines in our pre-Islamic darkness. Okay, so why they don't talk about Paurava is because he was before Islam came. But can we today name even one leader possessed of just a shadow of the integrity and character shown by Raja Paurava. So even though this is in Pakistan and written by a Pakistani, he says the integrity and character of Raja Paurava is unmatched. Unmatched, the Pakistani is willing to admit this. Okay, now why did he speak so highly of uh, Paurava? Okay, I'll just give a small interesting account. We'll just go back a little bit into Greek account. So there was a, another uh, great uh, philosopher and historian named Apollonius. And his story has been written by another historian named Philostratus. So in 44 Common Era, <coughs> Takshila was visited by a Greek philosopher named Apollonius. So this is almost 400 years, or 300 and almost 400 years after the great battle between Alexander. And uh, this is the text of that, and I have just put it down here. And they saw a temple, they say, in front of the wall, which was not far short of 100 feet in size, made of porphyry, and there was constructed within it a shrine, somewhat small as compared to the great size of the temple, which is also surrounded with columns and deserving of notice. So this is all description of the temple. Her bronze tablets were nailed into each of its walls, on which were engraved the exploits of Porus and Alexander. So in this temple in Takshila, there are engravings in bronze tablets nailed to the walls. And which gives an account of the historic fight between Paurava and Alexander. But the pattern was wrought with auriculous and silver and gold and black bronze. And you saw elephants, horses, soldiers, helmets, shields and spears, javelins and swords, all made of iron. And if we are to believe report in a respectable style of art resembling that of Zexius of Polygnotius and Euphena, who delighted in light and shade and infused into their designs. 
so he is describing the different style but the important point is here and the character of the picture was so also pleasing in itself for porus dedicated these designs after the death of the macedonian alexander so after the death of alexander paurava has built this temple or engraved whether the engraving came or the temple came either way paurava has actually put engravings on this temple in takshila after alexander's death who is depicted in them in the hour of victory reinstating porus who is wounded and presenting him with india which was now his gift and it is said that porus was grieved at the death of alexander so the greek historian has said that there is a temple which has the whole account and it talks about uh, the hour of victory reinstating porus see the point we should take with now we should take with a pinch of salt is the greeks have gone on and try to tell hour of victory hour of victory and victory for alexander but we have seen that there is something debatable about this whole victory because alexander was sending emissaries and trying to stop the battle so now it is a little confusing that uh, how we can say that this is a victory for alexander but once a greek historian has put down the information that alexander won the battle uh, which is plutarch who was before apollonius and once alexander himself has written in the past that you know i have defeated paurava it is very clear that any greek historian who comes later will write it in the same way and it is said that porus was grieved at the death of alexander so there is no reason for porova to grieve the death of alexander who came to him as an adversary fought with him but porova accepted the friendship of alexander which is what dr buddha prakash tries to say that they became friends he accepted the friendship now he is grieving because it is the death of a friend nothing more and nothing less and paurava is actually shown as a much greater person because now you can understand from his character that even though this person came as an adversary eventually he is willing to accept his friendship he is also willing he is also grieving at his death so that speaks about the character of paurava so now you contrast this character of paurava with the character of alexander who was out to get uh, as much territory as possible killing anybody who was his enemy so it is a big contrast and a difference and that is why even though uh, that author who is pakistani has gone ahead and admitted that you know what uh, there is no greater a king whom we can think of in history than raja paurava such a very strong statement he has said who had such good integrity and character okay so the greatness of paurava so alexander died on the way back to greece in 326 bc so alexander was dead in babylon so just a point to consider alexander was dead in distant babylon his greek garrison in the sindhu valley had deserted and paurava was now the unquestioned master of this country as sole sovereign he could have ordered the murals to turn history around and depict him in glorious victory and alexander in abject and shameful defeat but the punjabi king was not just great in physical stature see physical stature paurava is said to have been very very tall it is uh, they say five palms uh, uh, this thing they have some calculation uh, so apparently that comes out to be that he is almost 7 feet tall or maybe even more than 7 feet tall so he was great in physical stature he possessed also a soaring spirit and largess of the heart that few of us know the king ordered the murals so it is recorded by apollonius diarist in order not only to acknowledge his friendship with alexander but also to preserve history as it had actually unfolded in his wisdom the king knew that the creative passage of time was bound to alter history so what was this passage of time is basically eventually everyone will know that uh, paurava was a great king and that is the altar of history that he was looking for because he knew that passage of time itself will take care and tell people will understand who was alexander and who was paurava so that was the character and wisdom of paurava okay so that concludes most of the content so i will just put some concluding remarks on what i have uh, presented so far and try to summarize what we have covered so far as per plutarch and other greek historians alexander defeated paurava and alexander in his magnanimity returned paurava's kingdom along with surrounding territory this is what plutarch and greek historians are saying 
as per firdosi's books translations see i'm saying translations made by european purva slain by alexander but direct translation seems to indicate that paurava was still alive dr buddha prakash research indicates that paurava did not die in battle and did not lose the battle either rather his two sons died he also suggests that the truce was done king to king with alexander initiating the peace accord alexander initiating not paurava paurava was victorious as he retained his kingdom and perhaps also retained a very great place in history another piece of evidence is the fact that the writer kautilya makes no mention of the battle of alexander kautilya is chanakya he makes no mention of the battle of alexander it is possible that it had very little effect on the political equation at that time and paurava only became more powerful so paurava only became more powerful in this battle okay however all historians agree that alexander going back left paurava as the strategic victor see the point is that alexander turned back and we can see that paurava's battle also demoralized his forces they were not ready to go further when they heard that magadha kingdom has a huge army they were completely they completely gave up mentally they had given up and then alexander had no other option but to turn back so he alexander going back left paurava as the strategic victor he deserves our admiration as a great hindu warrior there is no doubt about this that we have to really show a lot of admiration for paurava uh, as a king with very good integrity for whom his people were very happy with and also he showed tremendous character when he did not try to alter history and he was truthful in his accounts because we can see that there seems to be a slight amount of untruthfulness when we look at other accounts it is possible that history has been manipulated a little bit very much possible to what extent we don't know but there is definitely evidence to show that some history has been manipulated when it went to greece and also when you look at uh, some of the translations made of firdosi's book however paurava when he put up the temple he did not try to change history he just stuck to the truth that speaks the volume of paurava's character as a king okay so i have put some references i will probably share them separately either in the group or i will share it with the admin so we can look at these references where i have picked up all the information from and that with that i will conclude and stop the presentation dhanyavadaha and thank you for the listening we can now open up for q and a